Well, I think we'll make it start. Um, and uh, so let me, uh, by way of introduction, say welcome to our digital event uh, called Reimagining Church Buildings. Uh, my name is Jonathan Tame. I'm the director of the Jubilee Center in Cambridge. And for those of you who haven't heard of us before now, the Jubilee Center is a research and policy think tank that offers biblical perspectives on current social, economic, and political issues. Uh, we've been around since 1983 and particularly came to sort of the national prominence through uh, leading the Keep Sunday Special campaign, which some of you may remember. And through our publications, training courses, and events, we seek to equip Christian leaders to be salt and light in the public square. Now, as part of our work, we publish each quarter a, a 4,000 word Cambridge paper on a topical issue. And in June, we took a break from politics and economics to explore architecture and specifically the topic of church buildings. Now, Nigel today to present some of the themes which he, he wrote about. Uh, Nigel is the founding director of Archangel, which is a, 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 and is a specialist conservation architect. Uh, he graduated uh, from the University of Cambridge and more recently completed an MA and now a PhD uh, in conservation from the University of York. Now, uh, with Nigel to discuss uh, his paper is a panel of people who are all concerned about the challenges as well as the opportunities around the stewardship of church buildings. So we're delighted to have Dee Dias, who is the director of the Center for the Study of Christianity and Culture at the University of York. Um, we have John Inch, the Bishop of Worcester, uh, who wrote the influential book, A Christian Theology of Place in 2003. And we have Anne Daughtry, a former lecturer and university chaplain who is now the Archdeacon of Halifax. So welcome to the panel and also to all of you who have joined us, um, up to 86 people now. Um, people registered from all over Britain and much further afield too. So if by any chance you have zoomed in from South Africa, India, uh, the USA, Sri Lanka or Hong Kong, good morning or good evening and you're all very welcome. Uh, before I hand over to Nigel, to to get uh, uh, some of the themes which he's raised. Uh, we will have an opportunity and if you look Q&A button and you can write in a question there at any point and at uh, a little bit later in this event I will start to look and see what questions are being asked and we can put those to the panel as well. And you can also vote for an existing question that's already been um, put there. So that way we can see the most popular questions coming up to the top. So without any further ado, let me uh, welcome Nigel and hand over to you to present uh, your perspective on reimagining church buildings. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I think first, uh, very briefly, um, a, a word about where I start from. Um, I have, uh, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I am a Christian uh, and I am an architect. And when I started off uh, professional, in my professional life, those two were in separate boxes. Um, I would now describe myself as a Christian architect um, and regard my faith as informing what I do as a designer and indeed um, vice versa and I suppose that's uh, perhaps the motivation behind uh, behind or one of the motivations behind the paper. I want to challenge um, our attitudes to church buildings um, within the church. Um, they can certainly be divisive things, um, they can easily consume vast amounts of time and energy and money, all of which um, can be seen as diverting from um, our ministries. For some, therefore, um, buildings are unremittingly bad. For others, 
uh, there's a sort of opposite view that buildings are unremittingly good. Uh, they can do no wrong and perhaps at that end of the spectrum uh, they can become um, an end in themselves. And I want to back against both of those uh, views and um, stake a claim for the centre ground. Um, in these uh, brief comments, I want to frame our discussion um, uh, to follow um, by looking at um, seven points from the uh, paper. And I'm, I've got some slides just to uh, give you something a little bit more interesting than me to look at, um, if I can find that. Um, so hopefully um, I can get this to play. Is that uh, on screen for everybody? Is that working? Okay, I'll take it. I'll take that as a yes. Excellent. Good. Um, so the first thing, buildings, I would say, are for everyone. Um, this uh, slide, two two churches here. One is um, a Baptist church, New Baptist church, being built in Suffolk. This is a photo from Friday of last week, and uh, a drawing of the church in Dura Europos um, in Syria. Um, which is the first known dedicated church building, uh, dates from the third century. Um, my prime, the primary thrust of this paper is that um, buildings are for everyone, regardless of our churchmanship. Um, even amongst those of us um, attending this event today, we'll have very, very different experiences of very different church buildings. Some of us may worship in a rented school hall, others uh, in a medieval treasure. Many of those uh, are attending from the UK, as we've just seen, but equally there are others from other parts of the world. And that will, in each of those places, there will be um, different experiences of church buildings. But whatever the case, the way we relate to that building will both reflect, and I would argue partly shape, our theology. Second um, point is that buildings are vulnerable. Um, the issue of the day, of course, is coronavirus, and we, we may well come on to discuss that. If, uh, as the song goes, if video killed the radio star, I wonder what the virus will do to church buildings. In the UK, at least, um, churches have been unable to meet for regular worship, worship for months on end. In a sense, Zoom has rescued us uh, and enabled the church to carry on, but I wonder at what cost. Of course, we should acknowledge that Zoom allows us to have this meeting and to have it in a different format and with a wider audience, so there is much to be thankful for. But I wonder what we lose by not meeting in person. Um, some may conclude that we've proved that we do not need these awkward things called buildings. That I believe, if that were the conclusion, I think that would be a tragedy uh, and would be a turning away from our calling to be doing theology in the midst of our communities. The third point um, is that buildings uh, reflect our theological ambition. Richard Kiekeffer, um, for example, offers a threefold typology of churches, the classic sacramental, um, like this one here, uh, this is uh, St. Uh, St Edmundsbury Cathedral, um, a, a linear building perhaps with side aisles, uh, an apse, a chapel, etc. We then have the classic evangelical, an auditorium for preaching whose focus is the pulpit, and the modern communal with, with facilities uh, for gathering people for worship um, and the constitution of community through generous social spaces. Quite what, what we do in that typology with Lakewood is, is, is quite another matter, a big stadium church. Uh, and, and many of our churches won't fit neatly into uh, any of those three categories, um, but rather will represent a mix of influences. The fourth point, I suppose, is that buildings stand for community. Um, Buildings, church buildings are really important in my view um, in the countercultural work of transforming groups of individuals into church communities. The uh, drawing at the bottom in this picture is of um, a scheme, uh, St. Philip's Church in Cambridge here. Um, and this 
building is conceived as a series of different spaces catering for community in a different way. We have a hospitality space, which is a cafe at the front uh, on, onto Busy Mill Road. We then have a, a space, a sort of lounge space that can be created by closing two sets of sliding folding doors. Uh, which permits um, uh, different types of community activity, mums and toddlers, that sort of thing. And then we have the worship space at the end, uh, which also houses all sorts of other activities. They screen um, World Cup football, etc. those sorts of things. So different forms of community. I think that church buildings demonstrate our commitment as church communities to our locality. It communicates an investment in it, both of energy and time, and very definitely of money. And they also project a visible identity within that wider community. It, um, in a sense, we literally, we have an address. People can find us um, through our building. And finally, they e equip us to serve those around us, to, to reach out into the community and, and serve it. Fifth um, is that buildings are a form of narrative. We love story. We, humans are a storied people and I think it is helpful to see church buildings in something of the same way as narratives and particularly historic church buildings which um, again we may come on to to talk at uh, talk about later. Most um, historic buildings, if they're of any significant age, will have changed over the course of time. And um, certainly the type of buildings that I work with, I, I work with um, about 50 listed church buildings, mostly in um, Ely Diocese. And almost without exception, they have grown and changed over time, reflecting different fashions and different needs. So the building, if the building is an answer, that answer has changed as the question has changed. It's flexed and changed. And th there's a conservation argument to say that that's precisely why they have survived. That, that change is not a bad thing, but a good thing. Um, it's why we still have them. Um, this building is Wyndham Abbey in Norfolk, um, just to the west of Norwich. Fantastic building. That, this used to be uh, a much part of a much bigger um, development, uh, monastic um, settlement. Um, and there's a very interesting story here about the relationship between the monastic settlement and, and, and the parish, a uh, somewhat contested relationship, I have to say. Um, but the metaphor applies across uh, most buildings, at least in my experience, that um, we inherit a, an incomplete story. Uh, we imagine, say, that we, the story to date has had eight chapters, and our job in the current generation may or may not be to write a ninth chapter. And if we're going to write that chapter well, we're going to need to preserve the integrity of the narrative. And that means understanding the story to date as best as we possibly can, but also being creative in the present, uh, not being afraid of change, and uh, finally leaving space for future generations to add their chapters. So we're not trying to write the definitive chapter, we're just trying to move the narrative on. Sixth point is that um, I would say buildings are profoundly theological. Um, this is a different point from uh, the one before um, in terms of buildings reflecting theological taste. Buildings are profoundly theological and I think uh, are an expression of practical theology, not applied theology, as in you think up some ideas and then put them into physical form in a one-way relationship. But practical theology implies to me that it's a two-way relationship, that the building, both the process of building the thing and inhabiting and using, also informs the way our theology uh, is shaped and therefore how we uh, relate to those around us. So I think that um, buildings, church buildings particularly, raise some really useful questions about who we are before God in the world. Um, somewhat to my own surprise, I've come to believe that they, we can even see them as a prime point of entry into doing theology. While there may well be dangers in taking buildings um, too seriously, I believe in our present age and culture the greater danger lies in the opposite direction of ignoring them and detaching ourselves from our physical environment. 
Which brings us finally to um, the seventh point. Buildings are an expression of how we dwell. I'm thinking, of course, of the resonance here of um, John chapter one. If Jesus did more than merely pass through this created world, but himself put down roots by dwelling among us, surely that's a pretty strong hint that we are called to do the same. The sort of buildings with which we choose to clothe our common life, whether that building is modern or ancient, whether it's owned or rented, those buildings are impor an important part of that incarnational call for us to dwell. Which brings us back to where we started. Buildings are for everyone, regardless of our churchmanship. We need to get away from thinking that buildings fit neatly within an access from low to high churchmanship. They're much more interesting and much more theologically fruitful. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Nigel, for introducing us uh, to, the, uh, to the themes in your paper. Um, I hope many of you have been able to uh, have a look at the paper in advance. Um, there's a printed copy here, which we have. Um, so there's, there's a lot of key themes there, and, and the, the title itself, Reimagining Church Buildings, suggest something of a challenge. Um, so let me go and start uh, with the panelist, Dee Dias. Would you like to come in and, and add your points to what uh, Nigel has been saying? What's your perspective? You need to unmute. Sorry, Dee. Uh, Dee. Yeah. Yes, sorry, thank you, yeah. Jonathan. Um, I found that very stimulating and helpful. I've got three perspectives on this. As a Christian minister, as an academic, who spent much of her life exploring the theological relationship, practical relationship between place and um, engaging people. And also part of my work, a great deal of my work, is working alongside churches and cathedrals to help them use their buildings to engage both with congregations and with visitors and local communities. So my interests are both um, in terms of study, but also in terms of prat sheer practicalities. And I think um, I'd really second a lot of those, those points and um, look at the, also to, I think we need to look at the fact that buildings are important, not just for our congregations. I'm currently running a survey for the Church of England and Historic England on the impact of COVID and the closure of buildings. And some of the responses we're getting from the wider community show just how important as Nigel said, they give us an address. The buildings give us an address. And while virtual online worship has done a lot for congregations, though it doesn't solve all the problems, for other people, they don't know where to find us. And they're used to finding comfort and hope, especially in times of crises within our buildings. Those buildings speak. It's partly because, as Nigel said, they're part of a long-term story. They hold the memories of communities very often. That's why you have so many problems when you want to change something. Because often people outside the church just rely on that stability and that story for their own identity. So that's something we need to take really seriously. But I also completely agree that um, we are but one chapter in an ongoing story. And we have, to safe, we have to understand what's come before. I used to train ordinance for 10 years. And when it comes to reordering, Buildings have been made the way they are. They've been changed because of worship needs, because of mission needs. And unless we understand why we've got what we've got, we are likely to have lots of unintended consequences if we just change it in a fairly random fashion. But we also do need to respond to the needs of today. I've done trilogy training sessions where people are amazed that buildings, my team actually recreated a model of a parish church from Anglo-Saxon through to Reformation. And the changes are extraordinary because we have to respond. Our job is to care for those today and their mission needs, their worship needs, their community needs, their social needs. And that does mean change. And as I tended to say in those circumstances, actually, um, Church of England is very bound by tradition, but actually change is our tradition. Change and adaptation are our tradition. 
so it isn't actually a break with it if we adapt to the needs of today. And just one um, other final thing. I think I work a lot on sensory experience and how from the tabernacle and the temple onwards, buildings have had a special role. I don't think they, they need to be seen as having a special quality, but they have a special role in showing us more about God, helping us and encouraging us to respond and to allow us to be transformed as he wants to do, each of us as individuals and as communities. And that's what buildings and liturgies together are supposed to do. And so all the time we must be thinking, does that do it in the way that we need now? And how does engaging and interacting with these buildings, whether you come in as a visitor and are just completely wowed and made to think about God for the first time, and we shouldn't underestimate the tourism aspect. If you could wander in as a member of the local community, I'm getting loads of responses at the moment that say, I'm missing it so much. It was my safe place. It was my place of comfort, my place of hope. Um, please don't keep, don't shut the buildings, keep them open, keep them open. The buildings matter. So as physical beings, our environment really matters. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Dee. I think uh, th there's so many different layers of engagement with buildings, of course, and, and many of the people uh, listening today are going to be those responsible for buildings and can often see just so that or feel the weight of that responsibility. But there's so much more to our buildings. Now, John, if I can come over to you, you're, um, you've written and thought a lot about the theology of place. And so how can we understand that in, in, as we look at these issues today? Well, thank you, Jonathan. It's, it's uh, kind of you to, to, to mention my book, uh, which I recommend to anyone who's suffering from insomnia. Um, it's, it's still available. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the force of it is that in our faith, place is important, um, not only because God chose to have a relationship with his chosen people, not anywhere, but in the promised land. And within the Old Testament, uh, special places are, are very clearly of importance. But even moving to the New Testament, um, God chooses to be incarnated at a particular place in a particular time. And, and place is absolutely integral to the way in which God uh, reacts, interacts with the world and, and our place within it. And churches have a particular role within that. I very much warm uh, to Nigel's, what he described as middle way. There are those, as he said, who would see uh, buildings as exclusively a, a burden. Uh, there are those who would see them exclusively as a blessing. Um, and neither of those positions is, is, is uh, tenable. Uh, I mean, one doesn't have to minister in, in a cathedral for very long to realize that buildings can people can develop an idolatrous attitude towards buildings o on the other hand it seems to me that uh, those who don't recognize uh, the power that buildings can have as Dee has intimated are, are selling short their faith um, and the fact is that that in our country we have this extraordinary wealth of churches which still speak to people of, of the, the living God. Um, the, the, the Gothic spire was described once as a vast question mark thrust heavenward um, and th that that's it still does speak it's very easy to to take it uh, for granted uh, the grass is always greener on the other side they say um until just recently i could have taken you to uh, non-denominal church leaders in worcester who who said to me have you got a church we could have because as d said they wanted an address they were meeting in schools uh, they were invisible uh, whereas of course uh, some of our incumbents um <clears throat> Uh, uh, really feel that uh, they're having to devote too much of their time to the upkeep and maintenance of, uh, of ancient buildings. Um, but it seems to me that buildings do have great, uh, great potential still uh, w within our church. Um, and the other side of ministering as a cathedral is, is knowing how, as, as D suggests they do speak to people, and they are indeed uh, a point of entry not only into theology but but into faith, <clears throat> because um, someone once described a, a cathedral as being like a vast sursum corda in stone. It's inviting us to lift up our hearts, uh, and there is that wow factor when you enter into a a, a great building. But it, it, there is also um, really something special about entering into any building which is set aside. Now, 
churches are set aside, it seems to me, rather like, I mean, you mentioned the Keep Sunday special campaign. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> we, we didn't have as much success in that. Uh, there was someone once observed, having given up on the Sabbath, we've, we had a whole truckload of them thrown at us early this year um, during lockdown. Um, but but s buildings are set aside not uh, instead of the whole, they're, they're set aside in, on behalf of the whole. So we keep Sunday special, not because Sunday is any more holy than any other day, but, but in order to demonstrate the truth that all time belongs to God. We set churches aside in order to, to recognise uh, the, the truth that all place belongs to God. Uh, so we, we need God in church so that we might find God elsewhere. It seems to me that uh, we, we suffer. I mean, Nigel correctly drew attention to the narrative. Uh, the danger of our conservation movement, I mean, clearly, once again, one has two poles. Uh, on, on the one hand, the, the, there are those who, who might want to destroy um, really uh, ancient fabric. On the other, the, there are those who, who want to turn our buildings into aspic, and that, that's no good either, um, because they must live, they must change um, if, if they're going to be of, of any use buildings change uh, as time goes on and it seems to me that in terms of the uh, the, the various uh, seven headings that one of the things that this connects to this one of the things that buildings ought to be doing is symbolizing the Christian faith and if they symbolize the Christian faith they should symbolize not only the first great commandment uh, to, to love God uh, with all our hearts our soul our, our mind and our voice um, but, but also symbolizing the great the second great commandment of loving our neighbor and that's where the the community aspect comes in and then Finally, I would say that it is really important to recognise that our church buildings belong to everyone. I mean, in fact, the ancient church buildings of our land uh, <clears throat> are everyone's heritage. Um, I'm fond of pointing out in lobbying government that we are, in the Church of England, the least established church in Europe in financial terms. Every other country takes much more responsibility for the upkeep of buildings. So um, there's already, a, someone has asked, um, uh, uh, about uh, the, the, the problem of expensive buildings. Well, I'm, I'm wanting to lobby for us to have more help from the state uh, and indeed more help from those communities uh, which, as, as Dee has suggested, actually value their church buildings, even though they might not attend them uh, every week. So um, let's, let's not pretend that every church building is a blessing. We've all been into church buildings um, and well, if you're anything like me, found it difficult to think how this building might possibly be a blessing to anyone. Uh, but not, let's not think of them either as being, being a burden. Uh, and let's, let's uh, value what God has done through them and can continue to do through them. Mm, thank you so much, John. Um, I wonder, Anne, you're, you're Archdeacon of, uh, Halifax, of Halifax in Yorkshire. And I expect you have quite a wide range of different churches uh, in, in your area. Can you think of some examples to illustrate what we've been talking about up to now? Yeah, um, I think that um, if I can just go back to something Nigel said first, um, you know, the, the buildings are an incarnational part of the community. And I think during, during COVID, it struck me in particular um, that that is very true. The fact, as Dee says, that our buildings have been shut has meant that a lot of people have had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And I was taking a service on the first Sunday when we were back reopen and I um, came out of the church so that I could greet people as they came out in, in the grounds and the bus stopped and the bus driver wound down his window and he said, great to see you back, we've missed you. Uh, and that to me actually meant that it was really important and I think sometimes as churches we think that we know what the community needs and wants we, we sometimes take what co congregations want and we actually say okay this is what the community needs and wants but very often we haven't asked the community what what they want um and there's there's a, there's a a little rural church in, in my area called, called, called Denby and, and a few years ago um, the parish were considering petitioning for closure but um, then the community association came along and said 
actually this building is really important to us both as a church but also as a community space and the community have raised all the money to convert it into um, a multi-purpose both church and community space uh, and, and that building has now secured its future um, so so if we're wondering should a church close I think we need to ju not just look at tired PCCs or PCCs having to raise vast amounts of money. We need to find out what the community needs and whether they will engage with us on that journey. Um, a further example is a, a village called Flockton in, in my area, um, where it was the local council who came to the church and they said um, the building we hold the lunch club has closed can we use the church and um i was able to give temporary permission uh, for them to move enough things for that to happen and two years later the church had been divided into a worship space and inclusion space uh, and it's got a future now as the community building at the heart of its funding community no, that, that's a great illustration of how uh, this this tradition of of constantly changing. You know, it's it sounds like a contradiction in terms, but clearly is uh, some great examples of doing that. And obviously, Nigel, as an architect, uh, is someone who is who's bringing that expertise in terms of how you do that practically. Then, of course, there is a question of the cost and this this conversation. Interestingly, um, the comments you're making already show that in a sense the church buildings have both a role for the members of the church but then they also have this role in the wider community this public uh, they are a public good um, not all of them but very many of them that sit in the center of our towns and villages and i wonder is can you see as we reimagine church buildings especially right now are there ways to try and um, build those bridges with with local government or even or even national government to see whether we can uh, express that value more holistically. Right. Can I say something about that? I think um, we, we were. To, I was a member of the Taylor Review, and we were told constantly that there was simply no more money available. That it was absolutely impossible for there to be more government money. Uh, we're now in a situation where uh, the government is. Um, well, it seems like there is a money tree for the moment at any rate. Um, and, and I think it is important uh, to, to, to lobby for uh, much, much more money, recognising they are a public good. I think we have, we, we've been in a very difficult situation during COVID. I mean, th th this is one area in all times of national and indeed local crisis in the past, churches have come into their own and that hasn't been possible. Uh, I think people have forgotten that it wasn't us who decided to church, close our church buildings, it was the government that required us to close our church buildings, but it has meant that people haven't been able to use their buildings and they haven't uh, been at the center of their communities in, in ways that they would have been at other times, uh, though uh, it's wonderful to see all the good work that the church has been doing albeit most, a lot of it invisibly. I, I think one of the things I would say is that, I mean, there's quite a lot of talk as those who engage in theology will know about faithful improvisation uh, as a way of going uh, forward at the moment. We mentioned the ninth chapter of a, a book and Sam Wells and Bishop Tom Wright have written about the job of the Christian life to, to be to improvise faithfully on the scriptures and on the tradition in, um, as, it, as it were, an extra an act of a play. And I think that's what we have to do with buildings uh, as well. Um, but I do think we used to need to make use of the mammon of unrighteousness and lobby for uh, much more government support than is, is presently being given. One of the ways in which that can happen at the moment, possibly, I mean, we're working in Parliament to try and make sure that, and this is something that's being supported in all sorts of other areas as well, as Nigel will know, uh, support a, a move so that... Um, VAT uh, won't be charged on repairs in the way that it, it, it isn't on new build. I mean, that's crazy from an environmental perspective. And we, we really need to be lobbying hard about that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Nigel, unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, just, just to, always gets, catches you out, doesn't it? Um, just to add a, 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 a point at the other end of the sort of government spectrum um, to, to um, John's, and that is that... Um, you know, we, we have these different tiers of government from 
you know, from parish council through district and county, you know, and, and national. And um, I always encourage churches to try and build um, alliances um, mm. it, with those secular bodies, because once, once you, usually once you start talking, unless there is somebody with, you know, an absolutely visceral hatred of, you know, anything to do with church, in which case, you know, that is going to be an obstacle. So often you find um, the secular bodies being, you know, uh, astonished at what the church does and how closely the church, you know, an active and community engaged church, the extent to which the church is doing the stuff that the council either can't or won't. Um, but yeah, yet they recognize it as good news in their terms. And so there's, I, I think there is huge potential for, um, for those sorts of alliances. Whether or not that comes with any money is a separate question. Um, but it's the, the uh, first step is to have, it, it's, some churches are, are, work as sort of sealed units within the culture um, and others work with much crumblier edges. And I think we're called to have crumbly edges in terms of a lot of interchange with the culture, not taking everything that is, you know, uh, and not, not seeding the terms of the debate, but just talking for heaven's sake, you know, we need to be talking to these good people around us. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yes, D, do you want to chip in? And then in a moment, I'm going to start bringing in some of yeah. the, the questions. Just quickly follow up and endorse all of that. Um, I think one of the problems is as churches, sometimes we have divided thinking. We make divisions in our heads between worship and mission, um, between community and mission, uh, between tourism and mission. And actually every single way we engage with people um, is an opportunity for mission. We have to know people before we can build a relationship and they can, they can follow through on exploring faith. And I think it's really vital. Um, my husband used to run a, a church on a big council estate and we had everything from the baby clinic to the old people's club happening in that building. And then on Sundays we had worship and we had a thousand people through. We didn't have to go out into the streets and pull in a thousand people. They came on their own two feet and yeah. building those relationships was so much easier. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they became familiar with the spaces. So we, we need to think that we don't either do community service or we, or we do mission or we do mm. worship or we have buildings which function for any one of those, but not all of them. We can do it all and it works. Yes, yeah. uh, Anne, un uh, unmute and... Uh... Thank you. I, th I think it's very important to build bridges with local authorities um, or parish councils, etc. cetera. Um, we had one of our local authorities whose relationship was difficult with 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 places of worship um, and that has changed because they have realized that actually they can't do a lot of the stuff they used to do and actually the slack is being picked up by the faiths uh, and, mm -hmm. and and actually we are doing this stuff and they're starting to re-engage with us as partners now so that that feels a real shift in a positive way and I think the other thing to me is, is quite simply the fact that, yeah, we can't compartmentalise. We have to have crumbly edges because otherwise um, we're not going to know what, what, what people in the community want. I mean, we always encourage a church um, to, do, to do an audit, find out mm. what, what, mm. what the community wants. Uh, and we've got tools that we let people have to, mm. to do those audits because it's, it's really important. Yeah, I think this this question of language um, and building bridges is really important. Uh, the question that's come up on on with uh, the top of the list here in the Q and A is how do you think that that the theological and ecclesiological understanding of church buildings can help or hinder our engagement with secular views and externally imposed constraints on our historic par parish churches? So I don't know, Nigel, whether you can suggest. You know, how can we Turn, you know, how do we articulate this theological sort of perspective uh, in, in language? What kind of language can we use to build these bridges? 
Um, thank you. Um, so I, I think this comes down to um, change, um, which we touched on briefly. Uh, there's a great quote uh, from John Henry Newman um, that um, to live is to change and to be perfect is to have changed often. So the first part of that acknowledges that you know, living things change and um, a building, because it is um, in this partnership with a community of people um, and the heritage is the composite of those two or the nexus, the binding together of those two, because of that, we should not be afraid to change our historic buildings. This is, this is a conservation argument, but I would say it's a conservation argument that comes from, you know, with, with profound theological roots, because we in the church, I think, have a much, we are more familiar with change. I think when we're, when we're being church properly, we're not trying to tie things down into a static structure of knowledge, for example, because we are relating to a living God. And, you know, if we're relating well to the living God, we are being push pushed into all sorts of situations of change. So we're more change literate, if you like. And I think uh, th this is a separate sort of argument to the current discussion, but I think that that theological grounding actually is potentially transformative of secular conservation because Secular conservation deals really badly with what's termed living buildings, i.e. buildings that are still in use for the purposes for which they were built and which have a living community within them, i.e. You know, typically parish churches. You know, fantastic, the exemplar um, of that. And um, secular conservation deals very badly with that, which is why we have these arguments um, you know, about you know, what can I do to my church or not, and you have you know, people weighing in and saying, no, 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 stop, you can't do anything. Um, it, it's, it's an impoverished theory on the part of secular conservation, which I think that, well, I, I, I find it my um, sort of calling to try and um, sort of address that. So that, that's part of the background um, mm. for the paper. I suppose. Yes. yes. John, do you want to... Well, it is, it is true to say that we have the exemption, don't we? So that um, we're, we're not generally uh, entirely caught up with, with secular planning authorities for, for parish churches, uh, though there are difficulties with that. I, I'll, I'll, I'll stick my neck out and say something very controversial. I mean, actually, um, I think quite a lot of good things f uh, stemming, for example, from the, the uh, ruling that uh, pews could be removed from, from Bath Abbey, quite a, quite a lot of things are moving in the right direction um, but uh, we get um, there are probably some lawyers here who are going to kill me but we do get too tangled with lawyers in all this um, I think the the religious exemption uh, I mean to, but Bath Abbey it came through but the ecclesiastical uh, the, the cost uh, to Bath Abbey was something like 150,000 pounds that's that was because of the lawyers involved now I'll, I'll get shot for saying that um, but but uh, we, we, we need to do something. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that I, I think things are moving in the right direction, um, but we need to make it easier whilst uh, and preserving the best, but moving on, allowing buildings to live and change. Yeah. Let, let me um, bring in a, a, another question here that's coming up to the top from David Knight saying, uh, is it a good goal to want to bring a virtual worshipper into a congregation in person? How far should congregational worship be adapted to be a good viewing experience and so that people can participate from afar? So this is talking about adaptation and change and obviously imposed on us right now. But I don't know, Dee, I mean, in your research, have you explored some of these themes? Um, currently, yes. Um, looking at the obviously what's happening with COVID. And it has to be said, the virtual worship is actually solving some existing problems, say in a large rural parish where you've got a number of churches and people have never been able to worship together. And now, sometimes they're now worshiping together every Sunday, which is brilliant. And building community and building um, people, building in people who perhaps were very occasional um, worshippers. I think that we need to, to and I've, I've seen a lot of clergy recently, they're beginning as they reopen within buildings, they're actually putting in screens so that the experience within the building is very similar to the virtual experience. And so it can be, again, it can be shared. We're mm -hmm. able to include people who perhaps because of disabilities or other reasons 
can't actually come and engage physically, that's also a great plus. But I think we need to look at the fact that um, what many, many people keep saying to me, either in my own church or, or uh, through the people we're contacting, is that they miss being physically present with yeah. other people and they miss being the, the impact of the physical presence and space of the building. So I think we need to look at, it's not an either or, it's one of, it, it's yet again, it's not, it's a false dichotomy to say, oh, we can ditch buildings. Because actually, I don't know about anybody else, but we have a wonderful vicar, but if he carried on broadcasting from his study forever, because he had no building, I don't think this, the engagement would be as great. Yeah. And, you know, it's partly people wanting to engage with beautiful buildings. And in the end, we are, a church is a community. Now, people can engage in different ways. If there is not a physical body that people can engage with, then we are not going to be a true church in the long run. And that's absolutely fine for others who can engage at different levels. Somewhere there has to be a heart. Yeah, yeah. I think it ought to be both and, as, as, as Dee said. I, I mean, Zoom is a good way in for some people. I, I, Zoom worship does nothing for me. Having spent hours and hours on Zoom during the week, the last thing I want to do is, is to... Um, try and get into my head around worship. But, but those who, it used to be said about cathedrals that it was great that, I mean, Susan Howard said, she, she hung around the pillars in, in Westminster Abbey for ages before she really dipped in. And the same can be true of Zoom worship, I think. I've had anecdotal evidence that Alpha has, has really benefited from people being able to engage from their own homes. It's much less threatening. Um, but it shouldn't be either or, because it, it seems to me that virtual worship and is, is, as Dee says, not, not a substitute for gathering together. Yeah, I think there's a, yeah, the hybrid, perhaps, that we are mm. currently exploring and developing, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and Anne and then Nigel. Yeah, I, th I think that some of our um, churches, um, you know, have done Zoom worship. It's brought in new people, um, mm -hmm. but actually some of the regulars have, have, have not engaged with it. So I think it's got to be both and. And one of the things that we've actually found as well is where people have gone back into church and just tried to Zoom, in, uh, not what they were doing, but just Zooming the service as it works in church, it's not working. You've mm -hmm. got to do something different that works and engages people with Zoom rather than just sort of, you know, almost a televised version of, of what's going on in church. Particularly, I mean, it might not be so with cathedrals and places where they've got the technology to do it well, but in average churches, uh, sometimes the, the, the actual broadcasting of what's going on in the church can be wonderful, but it can also be cringeworthy as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I would just um, uh, support. I, I think we need to um, move forward with a mixed economy. That, and indeed, I think we are called to do something different to what we were doing before, precisely for the reason that Dee uh, enumerated, that there are, it gives um, opportunities for access to people who haven't previously engaged with us. The question is how you tie the two together into into a, some sort of single experience, rather than having a, a sort of satellite, you know, separate service thing that, you know, g goes on in, in the ether. It, yeah, that's the, that's the real challenge, how to make the mixed economy meaningfully whole. Let, let me bring in um, a, a question here, which is um, perhaps for you, Nigel, to start with, but um, what, it's a great one. What is the essence of beauty and why is it important in design? I, I, this is wonderfully rich theological. So I'll, I'll Go ahead. Yes, what's the essence of beauty and why is it important uh, in design? Wow, um, sort of huge uh, question. Um, I think, I, I suppose I would answer it as to me, there is something about the delight of God in 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 beauty in artistic and cultural expression that is beautiful i i think it's close to god in some sense that i don't want to mention that thing when you look at in um i can never then but um you know when they're creating the tabernacle that the names craftsman 
who um, who are in 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 you know material working. Um, they, they there's really important about it to God. Um, so that's about as far as I think I could go. Yeah. Uh, it, Bezalel was the uh, the great artist sort of uh, yeah. making the tabernacle. And interesting, he was the first person in the scriptures to be described as being filled with the spirit. Anyway, Dee, you wanted to do yes, Um Terry, yeah. I've just finished an extremely long book on the sort of dynamics of space and sensory experience. And I think right through, as you've said, from the tabernacle, the temple, and through all Christian buildings from the Anglo-Saxon period onwards in this country, Beauty is used to signify the presence, the power, and the holiness of God. And they're telling, beauty is used to tell us things about God, just as creation in the Psalms reveals God to us. And then it's used to, because we can only, we're human beings, we can only learn or respond through our senses. And there, there are an awful lot of those, according to the nearest scientists today, at least 30 of them. We can, it's that that stimulates our understanding, stimulates our response and ideally create some sort of transformative experience. And so beauty really does matter. And I think that's one thing that we, we need to look at more. When we've got a historic building or we've got features, I think we'll get a lot further with trying to develop buildings. If we understand the value of what we've got, we can argue for what understanding what we've got that people do respond to. So many people walk into a building, walk into a cathedral, but into a parish church and are just they're hit by something beyond themselves. And that craftsmanship, imitating the creativity of God, is what has communicated something about God, something beyond themselves, which then opens the door for them to walk through and explore for themselves. And we need to value that. It can be equally true in a modern building. Um, there can be beauty, there can be a sense of holiness, sense of space. But we need to know that that matters to people, everybody. Everybody's potentially a spiritually responsive human being. And the beauty is key. And people talk about it all the time. My previous research, it was the beauty of the building. Yes. It, it filled me with awe. The beauty of the building touched me. It moved me to tears. The beauty of the building and the music. And so it goes on. Yeah. Can I, John. John, can I come in? Thank you, um, Dee, for that. I mean, there's an awful lot one can say about uh, beauty in relation to theology, the beauty of God uh, associated with God. But I think... <clears throat> I'd want to touch on uh, what Dee said. I, I, I mentioned earlier about people going into cathedrals and, and that, that wow factor, the Sersum Cordon Stone, lifting up the heart. And it seems to me that um, a sense of awe, uh, which uh, Dee talks about, is very close to a sense of worship. Uh, when you experience a sense of awe, you, you are lifted out, out of yourself. And that can be with a, with a beautiful sunset. It can be with a glorious uh, scene of, of any sort. But... but churches should be beautiful. The, the other side to that, which we need to be very careful about, is the association uh, with one particular type of culture. Um, and there is a danger, I think, in the Church of England uh, of being um, killed by good taste. Um, I, when I was worked as canon missioner at Ely Cathedral, we had, a, <clears throat> we had students from Ridley Hall, and I, and I asked them to just m mill around and talk to, to tourists uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, and one, in, in a report at the end, wrote a, a memorable phrase. He, said, phrase. he said, over the west end of this cathedral, there is um, a virtual sign which reads, sun readers not welcome. Um, now, the trouble is that many of our churches are associated with a sort of culture that I love. I mean, I, I love choral even song, I love all that, but it's, it's so alien um, to the vast majority of, of the population now. So we have to be very careful about um, claiming one sort of uh, engagement with, with beauty, as, uh, which is cultural. But I do think beauty and a sense of awe are hugely important and encouraging us to lift our hearts towards God. Yeah, can, I I just, can I just jump in? Uh, there's, I think the, the same applies at the other end of the spectrum in terms of new design. Um, and in places that, um, you know, are pretty bleak, because there's quite a lot of Britain that is quite bleak. Um, and where there are opportunities, for example, you know, to build a new church on a post-war housing estate, for example, which sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, crops up, 
um, the church, you know, th there are two ways to go. You, you go the, the sort of minimal cost bit because the money is always short uh, and you end up with a sort of community center type thing. Or is it possible to introduce some real design quality? Because that's one of the things that is so lacking because people have never had that in that situation. They've never, you know, the <coughs> post-war architecture tends to be um, treating people as a function of a calculation, um, mm. you know, treating people in abstract. Whereas this is about, there's something about the beauty that in which individuals are able to, you know, be affirmed and, and you know, we hoped ultimately to meet God. Yeah. Um, there's a few questions here um, coming up around this thorny question of, of how to pay things and, and where our priorities should lie. Um, I don't know, have we, uh, you know, have we exhausted the discussion around that? Are there, I mean, one of the questions I saw earlier was, um, you know, why people come from all over the world to look at European cathedrals, which have extraordinary histories behind them, of course. And, why don't we build things like that today? Um, can, I, can I just, how, can I just how, come in on that? <clears throat> I mean, it's really interesting to see the proposals for the Wall of Answered Prayer outside Birmingham, isn't it? Yes. Um, a, a thing which is go going to be, God willing, a thing of great beauty. Um, yeah. And I think there is something about, uh, the, uh, re relating to, to what Nigel said about how seriously we take people by in terms of uh, the buildings we give them so for example if you look at, at victorian architecture civic architecture i mean the magistrates building the town hall stood out because that was sending a sign out that this is really important um, that we take our society seriously and and if we if if we build um, churches, big or small, to be beautiful and to be not simply utilitarian and cheap, we are sending out a powerful symbol, I think. Yes, um, and but, well, how do we deal with this conundrum then, that, that you, you have a certain budget and it, the money is either divided between the building or the people, and it's a very hard one. You could say, gosh, we could pay for two salaries for youth workers or, you know, missionaries, for the same cost as you know whatever it might be with the building is there some way of thinking about the the way we allocate resources in such a way that these don't compete uh in in such a kind of an intense way um some somebody raised in the chat i saw earlier um the observation that the bit in haggai where um uh, you know, that the, the God is worshipped in a, in a wooden temple, but people are living in stone houses. There is something about um, our willingness to, we, we do spend a lot of money on our houses, you know, think grand designs, you know, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we have, so there is still the wealth that went into, you know, the, 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 the wealth that created these extraordinary cathedrals that we have. There, there is still the, it's just that there is to as the usefulness or need or ambition can to deploy that commonly to the glory of god now um i absolutely agree jonathan we should be moving away from a you know a conflict between people ministry versus you know physical stuff it, it, we, we've got to find a way of, of of it being both they shouldn't be in the same accounting line as it were because because they are quite yeah. different and also of course you know the 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 building the building lasts for 100 years 200 years 500 years you know etc and so we are bequeathing we have a choice to bequeath um those that come after us you know who are fellow members of our community the communion of saints we have the ability to bequeath them something mean nasty horrible you know short and brutish shall we say or something that is affirming on which they can build it would be better to build less better than to build to than to fulfill a spatial brief in in poverty as it were mm. I, I it is our theology i'm convinced you know as i read your paper nigel and sort of reflected on this and even this discussion now it's so clear that if our if our theology is is more joined up perhaps more holistic we will see the extraordinary witness if you like that can come through our buildings and how it can be uh, uh, not uh, a con you know in competition with 
our sort of human ministry, but an absolute sort of complementary relationship. Yeah, Anne. I, th I think it also speaks to the church being there in the community, you know, whether it's a spire or a tower. I worked in Manchester diocese for many years and there were a number of 19 churches that were closed in the 1960s, demolished, and they just left the tower or the spire. But what that actually said is the church has gone from the, these places. Whereas actually, because, you know, the, the, the address that people could gather had gone, it was almost sort of this is where the church used to be. Um, but, but I think that whole sense of, of being incarnate at the centre of the community is something I would want to hang on to. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, I was just thinking that it's, da it's, da it's dangerous to talk about, oh, people often do talk about all parish churches, all, to all churches, as if they're the same, and they're not. And, you know, we go from tiny ones, which may have been built by the Lord of the Manor as a vanity project, and have never had a viable congregation, and we may have a small elderly congregation desperately trying to keep it alive. Um, I think we've got to work out each of us, our calling in our context, and actually figure out where we've come, where the church has come from, what its role was, what it was intended for, is that still true in a new, you know, community context or whatever geographical context, organisational context, mm. and just say what is our purpose now? What is the thing that we can uniquely do in our context? Then look around and say what assets have we got? What relationships have we got? What is the priority for us? Is it having um, this kind of building, these assets? Or I saw the question about, you know, what if you're in a rural congregation, rural setting, elderly congregation, other community assets? Well, um, I'm involved in actually all of us <laughs> on this call um, are involved in a project, possible project for how we actually begin to look at a new way of looking at sustainability of churches and having a sort of 360 view of everything that a church has going for it and could do in that setting. And I think that would get us away from trying to make everybody feel guilty that they should be doing everything mm -hmm. and instead say, what is our unique calling in this context? So what does our building need to be? What do we need to be? Who do we need to be working with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, John. Uh, um, many of on this call will, will know uh, Campbell. I was ministering in the Diocese of Ely when it was developed and the the, the developers published, uh, before it had been developed, a glossy brochure uh, which showed a sort of village green with what looked like a church alongside these smart new houses. And uh, the booklet read uh, that it was intended that there should be, I quote, um, a signature building with a significant vertical aspect um, in the centre of the village. That's um, politically correct language for a church, I imagine. But, but that, that demonstrates to me how in our psyche, uh, the, the notion of a church being in the centre of a community is, is very much around. And I think I'm absolutely with Dee. Not all churches are the same. We need to look at them differently. Um, but we mustn't just, just look from a here and now utilitarian point of view, particularly when, it's, when we're talking about churches that have been around for 100 years. And we must think, if, if there were to be a whole-scale closure of churches right across the land, what signal would that send out about the Christian church, about its place in our society, about its place in, in the communities uh, of our society? Um, there is a practical problem as well um, that uh, I'm sure Anne will be ve very well aware of, and that is that if, if a listed building uh, of significant architectural interest is, is closed, um, <clears throat> the responsibility for it because no other use will be found for it will, will pass to the dbf uh, and you then get the worst of all possible worlds you lose local community ownership of the church um but you still have to pay for it so um th that takes me back i think to, to the fact that we really need to press for more help with the upkeep of our ancient buildings which as i stress again are everybody's heritage so for those of you who are not Anglicans. DBF, I'm guessing, is the Diocesan Oh, sorry, Board yes, yeah. The right. Diocesan Board of Finance. Yes, yeah. Anglicans yeah. speak. Um, let me come to our last question, because we, our time is, is nearly gone. Um, and it's very much around, this is what Linda Taylor was uh, writing here, saying that somehow it's a lament, perhaps, from that, that we've 
had our buildings closed in the last few months and uh, that actually a place of hospitality and sanctuary um, in a time of crisis, it is really important. And, you know, and how can we respond, and especially if we're going into potentially further sort of a, a season of closing um, through the COVID pandemic right now, is there, is there some way that we can continue to um, provide some sort of place of hospitality and sanctuary? I mean, how, is there any way around this dilemma or, or perhaps the very dilemma itself is telling us how important actually our buildings uh, are to, to the community? Anyone want to chip in on that? Dee, Dee, are you able to address the, um, the last part of the question about um, did churches actually stay open during earlier pandemics? Yes. I, I, I think they did during the plague, didn't they? They, they absolutely did. In the, um, we, we're doing some research on this as part of the current COVID project. And um, in London, um, in the Great Plague, the churches were advised to close, decided not to, and actually provided socially distanced worship because they were aware of the risk of contagion, but also did community um, sort of welfare and, and counselling in between times. And after the First World War in the Spanish flu, the churches again took the decision to stay open. And I think it is a problem that the churches have been handed that at a point normally in every crisis or point of celebration, personal, communal, the churches have been there and have fulfilled a particular role and they haven't been allowed to do that this time. And that's something that really does need to be looked at. And in terms of the survey responses we're getting from, not just from churches, but from uh, the general public, there's a howl of anguish. Mm. You know, this closing churches made an already stressful time so much worse. That's a quote I've just looked at today. And it's as if these are places that people maybe only turn to in times of need, but they want them, they need them. And the effect mm -hmm. on emotional well-being, physical well-being, of not having fitness classes, socialization of kids from babies onwards, because of closure of toddler groups, children's activities, uniform groups, all of whom depend on church buildings. I think the government needs to think really seriously about the cost balancing the risk, just as they are with schools, mm. of the cost of this communal loss of communal support and well-being, and people who are not able to go to work because their aerobics class hasn't worked for three months and their back pains return to the point where they can't go and work for the NHS. You know, there are so many examples we're getting in of this. It can is incredibly important. John. Yeah, yes, can I, well, th thank you for that. Um, I, I'll, I'll say something else controversial. Um, there have been lots of uh, discussions uh, I'll put it politely, discussions behind the scenes. Um, I, I think we have arguably uh, the least Christian government, particularly uh, at the top, than we've had in living memory. And there really isn't an appreciation or an understanding or, or sympathy uh, with uh, the church and, and with faith in general. So getting across our message that these buildings are really important was very, very difficult in the early stages. Uh, and s someone pointed out in the chat uh, that we weren't forced to close buildings entirely, but we were forced to close them for public worship and private prayer. The argument was whether clergy could be allowed in. Uh, Worcester Cathedral was closed for longer than any time since 1215 when the Pope uh, excommunicated the entire nation. Uh, and, but I hope that the, 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 all the, the, the anguish that's been expressed since then will have had some aspect, uh, have some impact, had some impact. And, and I hope that we won't uh, be forced in a position uh, where, where we have to uh, closed into a position where we have to close churches again. I think it would be disastrous. But of course, a lot of the things to which D refers are still on hold. Um, the community aspects uh, of, of uh, church ministry. But it's. I, I think it's. Um, it's. It's a. It's a really fraught area. Oh. Well, thank you. I, our our time has really come out, even though uh, as, as come to an end. Even though we could go on uh, with this conversation, it, it's been very fruitful. And I really hope for all of you who are listening. Um, I'm sorry we haven't been able to uh, respond to each one of the, the questions you've put. Um, uh, I think if you want to, just a couple of points, um, we'll, we've recorded this session and we will put it up as a video um, on YouTube um, uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, all of those of you who registered for this event in advance, you'll get an email in a few minutes time which will give you
some links to um, some of the other resources that Jubilee Centre has put out, but also to, to where you, you're going to be able to find the recording of the uh, event today. Um, I think this has been a, a really valuable conversation and um, certainly has given me uh, some hope. I hope those of you listening as well, that you feel that there is some hope here. Do read Nigel's paper because there's some wonderful stuff there about the theology of place, which is so important, and, and how our church buildings, as we've been talking about just now, are, are absolutely um, key to our ministry in the communities around us.